I was asked in the interval to, uh, to ask two questions of the panelists, if I, if I, if I might. And, and one, I guess, is aimed at Mark, but anyone else who cares to answer it. And that would be, how do you know for certain that the decline of hen harriers is caused by shooting and uh, that it is not just part of the general decline of birds that unfortunately we've had to face for so many species? Okay, have a go at that. Um, the first answer would be that there's a whole load of science in the Journal of Applied Ecology, which we all keep referring to, which uh, demonstrates that that is the case. Um, I think the second is, as uh, Andrew quoted, um, Game Conservancy, which is, I think, the most reputable of the organisations that represent shooting interests in this country, uh, would absolutely agree that it is uh, illegal persecution by grouse moor managers that is the main reason for the lack of hen harriers. Andrew has done a podcast which is on the Birders Against Wildlife Crime website where he was very clear and commendably open and honest about it. So this does not appear to be contentious. And it's sad and bad, but it's not contentious. Andrew, do you believe it's not contentious? Or you no, I wouldn't. Uh, the, the, the reason that it is content, contentious for, and no doubt someone in the, the audience asked you, um, is this, it's a, it's a circular discussion because where's the, where's the evidence, as in the evidence on the ground? If crime is being committed, you know, show me, the, show me the criminal. Um, and if you can show me the criminal, then I can do something about it. And in, sense, in some respects, that's a frustration from some of the people inside the shooting community want to know how do I do it? How do I ostracise the person that, that is do doing this illegal activity? How do I find them? I'm saying it's a minority. How do I find this person? Because the police can't find them. I can't find them. So well, how am I supposed to sort it out? I think it's really a point of frustration rather than evidence. Okay. Um, Could I come back on that? Briefly. Very briefly. Mr Chairman. Very briefly. Um, I'm not sure that's completely true because I, I think that the shooting community does know names of some of the people who are responsible for some of this killing of hen harriers. Indeed, I think some of the names are quite well known, uh, because if you mention a few names in shooting circles, they all go, yes, I know what you mean. Um, I know who he is and uh, what he's doing. Um, so I'm not going to risk a libel suit by naming names, but the shooting community does know some of the people who are doing this, and some people are making lots of money out of managing moorlands in a totally uncompromising and illegal way, and you, you, the shooting community, do know who some of them are. You don't know who all of them are, but you do know who some of them are, so your answer is a little bit disingenuous. Chairman, as I've been accused of being disingenuous, perhaps I may be able to respond. <laughs> uh, please do. Um, uh, it's a type of sort of circular discussion which, which just repeats itself. If somebody has some evidence, take it to the police. It's being insinuated that you know, names are known. I don't know any. If someone knows them, if someone else in the room knows them, take them to the police. It's, it's the correct way to sort things out. And actually, who, is this just constant bluffing? Now, obviously, it's not constant bluffing because the evidence, the overriding scientific evidence would support that that's the case. And it really takes on to, hopefully, what might be a later question about what do we actually do? Well, how do we actually want to take this forward? Why don't, we, uh, why don't you elaborate on that and have a little debate on that question? How do you think we should take it forward? Yeah, we might be here for a little while. <laughs> I'm going to cut. I'm going to. I'm sure to you the will. Questions. I'm sure you will. There, there, there are there are there are there are effectively um, there are sort of three sort of ideas about about how to how to take things forward. There are various various merits. Um, there are a number of people that have commented on them. The three sort of broad options. Um, Mark's original suggestion of uh, banning a ban on driven grouse shooting. Um, there is. Um, also a suggestion that an alternative 
would be uh, the licensing um, of grouse moors. Um, and the third one is this uh, DEFRA joint recovery plan. Um, if you wanted to sort of describe, to, to look at those in, in, in detail, which I won't, but in summary, um, the licensing idea is quite an interesting one. There's no, there's no real, there's, no, there's nothing to go on yet. There's, there's no one else has actually produced a way that this actually s will stop uh, persecution and oversee the recovery of, of hen harriers or how it would actually work. It is something that was looked at in Scotland a few years ago to try and, try and address the issue and, in fact, wasn't taken forward because actually it sounds, starts off sounding like a great idea. But actually, when you start sitting down and writing the plan, how are you actually going to make it work? And how does that translate into, into more hen harriers? So that, that is a problem. Now, there probably is something in there. I, someone needs to actually work it out. No one has yet. Um, Marcus suggested a ban. Um, I've illustrated why I think that that's, that, that's, not, that's not great. Uh, and, it, and it's not a sensible and practical way forward. But that is, there's no point going back over that. Both of us have, have articulated that already. And I don't want to inflame and anger Mark any further. Um, <laughs> in, no has a red it, mist here. Well, <laughs> there's no red mist, but you do regularly write a blog about me as soon as I've conducted an interview, which I quite like because I can share it with my boss to show that I've actually been doing something. <laughs> <laughs> he has to read so He's been yeah. doing something. Yeah. Um, even if it's just annoying Mark. Um, and the third thing is this, is this way about, about, about trying, to, trying to find a constructive way forward. And we're right at the beginning, we talked about we all need to be braver. We all need to have more imagination. And perhaps actually what we need to do is put together a comprehensive package which looks at both tackling crime and DEFRA identified with the subgroup three areas to specifically work on. So specifically tackle crime and the policing of it. There are two measures to look at how do you actually try and uh, mitigate uh, this cycling effect or the lose-lose and try and make it into something positive so you actually have an abundance of both hen harriers and wader birds um, and grouse and you have all this management activity going on without turning around and saying, oh, by the way, it's now got to be funded uh, wholly by the, by the taxpayer because actually we're not going to take all this, this money off these rich city people and help, help recycle it through, through the countryside. Um, and finally, there's a measure in there to look at how we actually try and uh, at least engage with the other parts of uh, the UK, which have suitable, uh, England, which have suitable habitat, which don't actually have uh, an abundance of, of hen harriers. Uh, I live on the edge of the, of the New Forest. Uh, there's a winter roost site uh, only about five or six miles uh, from my house, the, the, a hen harrier winter roost site. But there isn't a summer one. And I suspect the local population would be thoroughly supportive of having um, hen harriers uh, in the new, new forest. I don't know, but I'd be quite interested to, to do an engagement study on that. Um, during hen harrier day, uh, while Chris and Mark were being, being soaked uh, up in the Pennines, um, I was actually on holiday down in, uh, down in Devon. Uh, I spent the day out on Dartmoor. I had eight hours of glorious sunshine. Um, but I didn't actually see any hen harriers, though there's plenty of suitable habitat there. So the choices, there really are these, these, these I suppose, there are, there are three choices I'm trying, I'm trying to make, Chairman, and people have got elegant answers for each of the three. Thank you. Uh, Chris, Bill, Gary, John, what do you want to say about these choices? Well, I, I just want to, um, <coughs> I hope, congratulate Mark on a nice piece of manipulation on <laughs> social media, as I believe, it call, as I believe it's called, because as you may have noticed, there's um, a move to choose Britain's most popular bird. And as top ten birds has been listed, and at the moment it's Robin, Blue Tit, Puffin, and at about number six or seven is Hen Harrier. I find that... <laughs> Either impressive or suspicious. I'm not sure which. <laughs> Good Lord. I'm serious. <laughs> oh, come on. Then. Oh, there's about ten people voted. <laughs> uh, you can all vote. You can all vote for the headhand. Yes, you, and you can vote six times. Oh, what? Oh, that's what it is. You're, you're, you're not, yeah. <laughs> well, it's working. <laughs> 
<laughs> Any? Uh, yeah, Andrew, well, I, I enjoyed your presentation. It was excellent, actually, I have to say. And um, the, the, there is one thing I would like to question, and, and you could provide me with an answer, I'm sure. Is you mentioned the, dec uh, the decline in waders that, uh, that subsequently occurred um, when the gamekeeping pressures were reduced. To what extent, if you're able, without looking at the papers again, uh, to what extent do you think that that was due, largely due to the lack of fox control? Um, we know, obviously, that foxes have a negative impact on that. And then I wonder, when you talk about the populations of both hen harrier, wading bird, and grouse declining, is it firstly because there's a lack of uh, wider predator, uh, predator uh, control, largely foxes? And then, why do you suppose that we ecologists aren't happy with a, a semi-natural system where those birds' populations are not as high as they are when they're artificially manipulated by extensive predator control? I know you might come back and say, well, yes, but in the old days we would have had wolves killing the foxes and therefore their population would have been regulated. Um, and therefore you might have had a few more hen harriers uh, and grouse. But the pressure of gamekeeping, keeping these wader populations high, I suppose, I might be wrong, it's a genuine question, is down to that wider predator removal, fox removal. Is that the case? Yes, the, the, uh, the science um, it is unanimous that the... the, the um, Generalist predators um, from foxes, crows, stoats, weasels are um, do impact on the, the ground nesting birds, and that that is the cause of decline. Um, Chris raises a valid, valid question about well, do what what population of waders do we a actually want um, in the in the uplands? And you know perhaps we don't need as many, and perhaps we should go back to, to back to back to, a, to an alternative level. And I don't think that necessarily that's up, up to us or the Game Wildlife Conservation Trust to decide. We pride ourselves on producing the evidence and, and, and are contributing to a, to a good and healthy debate about how to take things forward. I think we are, would probably be quite alarmed that we feel that um, with some of the species which are red-listed going into decline, um, our colleagues at the RSPB are, are busy raising money uh, to try and recover and help with the, the curlew population, how much more money are we going to start raising uh, if we start reducing that effort from, from the gamekeepers? I mean, the, we do have some genuine choices, and, and perhaps we should, if we wanted to, we should drop the expectations. And this is quite real. Um, it, outside our offices in, in Fording Bridge, the beautiful Hampshire Avon uh, Valley has been managed for, for, for wader birds for the same, same lack of um, it's a, it was an original special protection area. It's had every designation possible. All the farmers have done everything they've ever been asked to do. They've reduced the inputs. They've reduced the cattle grazing. Uh, they don't cut the hay until the second week in July. They've done everything they've been asked. But actually, the numbers are, the numbers are, are still collapsing. Now, we're proposing to go in and, and to look at how we can actually start intervening. And there are all sorts of things to look at. I'm not saying involving lethal, but actually perhaps we're starting with putting simple devices like cages over some of the nests so actually some of these generous predators can't actually get in, but the, but the birds can skip in, and, skip in and out of them. Um, but when I go and talk to some of the ornithological groups in the, in the Avon Valley, you will generally find at the end there are some people that come up and say, do you know what, all this effort, don't bother. Have the choices. And actually we okay. could in the Avon Valley just let them go. Because I think okay. we, we, we have to confess as conservationists that fox control is part and parcel of our remit too. If we build a nature reserve and over, allow it to be uh, overrun with foxes, we cannot either maintain artificially high numbers of waders. And some of our premises might be along the lines that we create these nuclei, breeding factories for avocet, waders, whatever they are, so that they can then try and spread out into a wider environment where fox control isn't managed. Fox and crow, and as you say, generalist predators. But it would seem that your argument about declining waders is based very heavily on that generalist predator control, and that might be seen as an artificial contrivance. Because, as you say, what is the correct level of waders in century 21, given the manipulated environment that that moorland already is and has been for hundreds of years? Sure. Um. I suppose my starting point would probably be more be revealed tomorrow by, by the RSPB on their, their state, of, state of Nature conference. Uh, if we've got these, these, wide, these declining numbers, 
if the declining numbers are important to us, then I, I feel that we should intervene as much as we can to be able to help. Or alternatively, we can say, <coughs> they are declining, let's not worry about it, let's not hold them, let's just allow them to, 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 to keep going down. I'm not sure I, I feel comfortable with that, but clearly there are plenty of people that are. Okay. I may not have answered your question. One, one, one last point, yeah, very briefly. Uh, we've, over the last 25 years, we've had a 62% decline in red shank and a 60% decline in, in lapwing populations as measured properly. Um, to shoot any of those birds, to shoot either of those birds would be seen as a criminal act and an antisocial act, where they've become conservation icons. Certainly the lapwing has very much a, a, a totemic bird of our countryside. Um, and yet, there is another species which has declined by 76%, so that's a higher percentage than either of those, another wading bird, which every winter is consistently shot. And I've had the pleasure of working with one of your colleagues who's investigating the biology of this bird, and that's the woodcock. So just to sweat the argument a, a little bit, you know, how, if we are intent on protecting our wader populations, is it still viable for the shooting fraternity to unregulated, in an unregulated fashion, shoot a bird which has been seen to be properly measured in a 76% decline over the last 25 years? How's that? How, what's the difference between woodcock and lapwing? They're both in precipitous decline, but one still gets wantonly shot. Well, how, how, how can we justify that? Because I, I, as a conservationist, I sort of struggle with the dichotomy between these two birds, which are both valuable components of our ecosystem. Sure. I sense a little bit of red mist, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, there's some good stats. Yeah. Fair enough. And, I, and, I, and um, that, that, that's more, more, more than valid. There's, there's a couple of statistics, particularly on the, on the, on the woodcock. Um, if you go back to 2003, it was assumed... Uh, the, and particularly the UK resident population of the woodcock, uh, that we had somewhere in between seven and 12,000 pairs uh, in the UK. Um, and there were calls, and that was when it first, the woodcock first went on to the amber list of, of conservation concern. And the, um, the data sets that, that we hold on the woodcock, and particularly the, uh, the, the National Game Bag Census data, so if we look at what people were shooting, um, and those data sets go back to sort of pre-Darwin times. If we look at those data sets, we couldn't see where there was this drop-off in, in woodcock, um, the number of woodcock being shot. So that gave us an, a hunch that perhaps there was something odd going on here. Um, and that's why, with the support of the British Trust for Ornithology, in 2003, uh, we conducted the first ever national count um, of the woodcock. Um, and not this original number of, of seven to seven to 12,000. Um, they found there were around 78,000 pairs. Now, that's un not unsurprising because the original counts from the BTO were done as part of general um, bird surveys. And uh, as part of walking those transects, it would be quite unusual for them to find woodcock, which are actually... Um, unless they were doing those transects at dawn and dusk, which, which would actually make it actually quite difficult to count the other birds. So um, it's unsurprising that they were being un, un, unreported. Um, so that gave us, um, if you like, greater confidence in what was happening with the, with the data. Um, Chris is right. We went out with, again, with a British Trust for Ornithology um, in 2013, and we counted them again. And there does appear to be Chris quite rightly pointed out, there does appear to be a decline. It's, a rel it's, not a, it's not a big decline, and if you get into the boring statistics, the scientific statistics, it's not statistically significant, but it is a decline, and we are concerned about it. It would appear that the range contractions are particularly, that we've observed from the, uh, the BTO data sets, are further to, to the south and to the west, it could well be that we've got, um, we've got changes in um, Andrew Hoodless's current logic on looking at those numbers and the things that we are most worried about. And this is on our website. If you'd like to have a look at it, we're quite clear about that, the contractions and what we think our, our concerns are. It is both, it could well be shooting, but we also know there's an increase uh, in deer and we're worried about the understory in some of these woods and ha how they're actually being managed. As part of this, as with the, uh, the grey partridge, what we want to do is we're trying to harness the 
you like, and try to think laterally, which is one of the things that Chris said that we should start doing and be braver about what we're looking at. Harness some of those people that are going out there and actually start collecting more data so we can actually understand more about what habitat the woodcock actually needs to be able to thrive. Is it impacted by, uh, by uh, greater uh, deer so pressure? I think you're saying that it's okay to shoot. Because you're taking yeah, quite a long time. Yes, you certainly. <laughs> to, Sorry, um, I was trying to answer the question yeah, about no, the, no, the fall you, you in the population. You are taking quite a long time which to answer it. the question, yeah. which was, given that this species is declining a lot, should you shoot it or not? But I'd like to come back to your point that um, gamekeeping is so good for our wildlife. Once mm. the Canadians yeah. and the Russians and the Norwegians and the Swedes decide they have to introduce driven grey shooting, to protect their wildlife, then I think we can start thinking about how we ought to protect uh, driven grey shooting to protect our wildlife. It's a relatively recent thing. That waders, hen harriers, grouse have lived together on this planet for long tens of thousands, millions of years before people dressed up and started shooting red grouse. It cannot possibly be necessary, normally, to have driven grouse shooting to protect our wildlife. There are some good things and some bad things about it, but you're making a mountain out of what is a tiny molehill. We don't need this rather peculiar form of field sport to protect our wildlife. Because nobody else does. Andrew, hold on, hold on a second. Sorry. Andrew, a very, very quick response of one minute, and then I'm going to the questions. That's not the response you'd get from our colleagues at the RSPB. Okay. Right, uh, thank you. Well, thank I think you. Thank you. Thank you. Mark, Mark, you can have a look at that. You can have a look. He's so I, I, would like some, I would like some questions. <laughs> a question with the guy with the beard. That modelling work has already been published uh, last month um, by Stephen Redpath from Aberdeen University. Nothing to do with us, uh, Environment Council funding, and yes, that, that, that has been published, and the shooting community would support that. Is there any documentation that shows that? The, um, the, the model, are you asking for the number for England, because that's what yeah. we, we, we were talking about? Yeah, there's that one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yes, there's three, 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 three and a half and four have been offered so far. Um, it's too low. Um, Stephen Redpath, in, in his paper, he actually looked at um, where the, the models, how it actually take it forward. Uh, his lowest range uh, was 35 pairs, and his highest was 70. Okay, 300, three, well, 300 in England. I can, I can answer that question. So I'm always told by uh, grouse warning trusts that they could cope with one pair of hen harriers on their grouse moor. And I'm told, but I could be corrected because this isn't my expertise, that there are about 140 grouse moors in England. So we could aim for 140, apparently without it being too much bother. It would be some bother. Um, but how do we get there? Um, if in 10 years' time there are 40 pairs of hen harriers nesting in England, whether they're on grouse moors or not on grouse moors, then I'd be quite happy with that as a rate of progress and happy to sit down and talk about all sorts of peculiar things like mood <coughs> management and everything else. But at the moment, we've got three or four. And the reason we've got three or four rather than 300 is because people are breaking the law. So let's get to 40 and then sit down and talk about how we get from 40 to 140. But the criminals ought to give some ground first. <laughs> okay, let's take another question. Yes. In relation to that, can I remind Mark that this time last year on Twitter, you said that you would be happy with 25 pairs uh, and, and an expectation of more. 
Okay, the, the, so, the, so, the, well, the, well, well, I just want to be clear whether, whether Mark accepts the science because you know, three or four weeks ago you said I'll get back to you. Uh, and I will get back to you, Philip. Well, Phil how about tonight? Uh, <laughs> not tonight. But um, uh, tr if, if you're promising me as a grouse moor owner and manager, which you are, if you're promising me 25 pairs of hen harriers in England pretty soon, um, that'd be good. Come back to me when we've got them and we can talk some more. But I think 40 would be quite a good figure, given the science that has recently been produced. 40, 40 pairs of hen harriers in England in the next 10 years would show goodwill and less criminality. Well, I don't okay. try and change my arguments, the and the figures do change a bit, but that is because hen harriers are going down in numbers, not up. So since I left the RSPB, which was actually when that was written, we've lost lots of hen harriers in England. We haven't gained them. And so you have to pay some, uh, a bigger price for our cooperation, given that the grouse moor community do not appear to be very uh, compliant with the law, nor very trustworthy, nor very compliant with finding a solution. Okay. La lady down there, please. Yeah, I, I think, as Mark has already intimated, that that is the sort of thing that we would explore if we had a greater number of birds to work with. It would, of course, be precarious to start moving the broods of just three pairs of hen harrier around if we concentrated on the English birds. Of course, there are other birds in other parts of the UK, Isle of Man, Scotland, and so forth. So you might argue that we could take broods of birds from hen harriers from there to reintroduce them. And we've proved that reintroduction is a technique which we've mastered. We've got kites flying around, we've got cranes on the way back, and corn crates and so on and so forth. So yes, of course, we would explore that technology, but not at the moment, because the one problem with the... Uh, with, with hen harriers is that they don't stay in one area. So we could move them so that they might breed in that area and return to breed it that there. But during their infancy, if you like, when they first fledge, they roam widely around the UK. And unfortunately, therefore, they would still be drawn to the habitat which is contemporary grouse moor. So unless we stop the persecution, there wouldn't be much point in moving them off the moor, nor in periling the small population that we have. So at some stage in the future, if there's no more criminal killing of hen harriers and we have more birds to work with, then yes, we'd be keen to explore that sort of thing. But it's not, not right now. The guy with the checker. We get the question. Get the question.
So what is the question? Can you get to the question, please? I'd like to just make a quick comment on that. that um, I think it is a separate issue. The fact that there are what is it, 35 to 40 million pheasants released into the wild just for the purpose of shooting them. Um, I've often asked the question um, rhetorically, because I'm not going to take size on this, you know, what is the difference between that and trap shooting pigeons, which was banned in the 1920s, I think. It was an Olympic sport. Just breeding birds in captivity to release into the wild, I find slightly bizarre. Um, and very inefficient. Um, apparently, some people like shooting these. I've had chickens which are wilder than the average pheasant. <laughs> Pheasants also do a lot of damage to wildlife. They eat slow worms, common lizards, uh, small frogs. They eat a whole range of vertebrates. Relatively, there is some research on it, but relatively little. Um, I think there's a big question around releasing pheasants on the, in these numbers into the wild, but I think it's slightly separate to what we're discussing at the moment. Um, does have an impact. But I, I see the same thing. You know, if I put food out for birds, it's quite likely to be taken by pheasants. There's somebody at the back. Yes. In the Uh, let's let's not have a discussion. The gentleman, make his point. What is the question? Question? One of your, um, you've just been corrected by an editor of one of the, the shooting magazines who regularly runs features about telling people that illegal persecution, illegal killing, must, is unacceptable. Okay. Are you asking about what? Okay. There's, there's, a, gentle, there's a gentleman there asked uh, once. Yes. Please, please, quiet, quiet. Gentleman there, please. Yeah, 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 just. <laughs> Please, gentlemen there, ask the question. Please uh, do understand, I'm from a wildlife charity, uh, not actually a representative of the, of the shooting community. But actually, how do, how do you do it? 
how do you, how you know, how would you even suggest if I was representing them and I um, and let's say I was from the British Shooting uh, British Association of Shooting and Conservation, um, what else what else can you do? We can't. It, it was a, right at the beginning we had the circular discussion um, about well. Where are the names? Everyone says that there are names. Well, give me the names. I'll give them to the police for you. I don't have the, have the names. If you had the names, you would. I listened to your talk at the League Against Cruel Sports uh, Symposium uh, on banning shooting. And everything that Bob had to say was exactly what our scientists would have said. We might not have spent quite so long on some of the slides, um, but actually what the message and what was said uh, was the same. But as a charity, and what we're doing as a charity, um, we don't have a crime investigation unit. We haven't um, invested in that. What we have invested in is 65 full-time scientists going out and monitoring and trying to come up with a practical solution. That is something which isn't being done by anybody else, and we hope that that will be useful in trying to resolve the conflict. We've discussed about we need to have an imaginative approach. Mark has suggested that if we had we set the target at 40 pairs in 10 years, I'm saying, why don't you just fix that as a target? We have an escalator about how many we need each year to get to the 40 and crack on with a plan. Okay. Uh, I just want to make I want to keep yes this no. quite quick, but John, A yes next. and no answer. Do any of the um, shooting organisations have a wildlife crime unit at all? They're partners to the, uh, no, no. The, the partners against wildlife crime. But they don't actually have any of their own crime units in the way the RSBB does. No. no. Okay. Uh, quick questions. I'm going to get my gender balance right. So the lady there who I think is wearing orange. Yes. <laughs> I love it. Um, They've got deep pockets. So. Right, exactly. <laughs> We could buy up half of Paraguay the amount of money we need for that, and we could conserve a hell of a lot more species. Yeah. <laughs> Lady over there. Maybe in the direction, how do you make sure that pairs are properly protected? Thank you, Mr. Well, I, I think we, you know, right. I, I don't want to side with the gamekeepers here, particularly, but we have to be realistic that these people are employed to do a job. Now, their job is to raise sufficient grouse to satisfy their employers, to satisfy the type of sport that they pursue. So, you know, shooting the gamekeeper is a bit like shooting the messenger. They are satisfying a job requirement. If they fail to do that, they're in danger of losing their job. What would you do if you were in danger of losing your job? You would... OK, so but basically what I'm saying is, you know, pointing the, pointing the finger or the metaphorical gun at the gamekeeper is possibly not the best thing to do because... You know, like anyone in that sort of situation, they're under tremendous pressure, perhaps from their employer. They may not be directly pressured, they might be told, but there's an implication there that if the shooting isn't of a required standard, it's going to be partially down to them. Now, surely it's the people who are regulating the shooting and organising that shooting, perhaps even the landowners, who should be held accountable for the actions of their keepers whom they are instructing. Absolutely. So, you know, mm -hmm. we... I think there are a lot of gamekeepers who possibly, I don't know, I like to idealise and, and romanticise, a lot of deal, uh, gamekeepers who probably don't want to go out and kill as many predators and as raptors as they feel that they have to, to satisfy their employer's requirements. Mm. So, uh, you know, I, I, I feel sorry for the gamekeepers, really. They're stuck, they're stuck in the middle here, aren't they? They're not the ones that are paying huge sums of money to shoot these grouse at the end of the day. They're the people that are out there that are being paid a small amount of money to raise the grouse for other people to kill. So I think we have to understand the predicament that they're in and focus perhaps more on the grouse more owners and those yeah. that manage that type of shooting. Yeah. All right, add very quickly. Yeah. Just, just very quickly to confirm exactly that, I remember being taken round a grouse moor in a shooting estate up in Scotland and uh, the situation there was pretty bad, there were snares all over the place, so on and so forth, it was really pretty horrible. But it was explained that um, the, the, uh, obviously the gamekeeper was under instructions from the owner there, and in fact the, ga the, the arrangement was that the gamekeeper would take the rap, basically. If, if he was discovered and he was fined, then he would take the rap. His governor would pay for it, and then he'd carry on working for him. 
that was the arrangement. Because the last thing that should happen is that the actual owner would be accused and convicted of doing the wrong thing. Okay, I think we got time for a couple more questions. I think there was a lady at the back somewhere. Did I see it? Is that? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Bob, maybe you should answer that one because you work closer with these people. <laughs> Bob, stand up and shout so everyone can hear. Okay, thanks, mate. <laughs> So I'm afraid we're going to run out of time for questions, but I will give each panellist one sentence that they want oh, to say. Well, one or two sentences. If you want to say something, just to sum up, one or two sentences very quickly, and then Chris will wind things up. So does anyone want to say one or two sentences? I would have liked, I would have liked to have asked a couple of very simple questions. One to Andrew is, what pleasure does he get out of killing things? And secondly, to Chris, Mark, anybody else here, um, if there was no shooting industry, would it be a better place? Would Britain be a better place? Would our wildlife be better off? Two you, leading questions. You can either ask, you can you say whatever you it's want. It's up to you, Chairman. Either, either I can give you my sentence or I can answer these. Uh, give me the, give it, give it the sentence because we really have okay. to. Okay. Um, can I pick that up? And anyone else who wants to join in on that? There will be a bar open afterwards. Yeah, yeah okay. it's a large bar for the profit. The profit. Um, my one, one sentence is, if we are looking at setting a target, as agreed in this room, of 40 pairs in 10 years, let's get on with it. Okay. Mark? Um, I'll answer Bill's question, I think, which is, um, would we be better off without the shooting industry? Um, Maybe, but I'm, I'm not totally sure about that. But I am sure that we would be better off and that wildlife would be better off and carbon emissions would be lower and water discoloration would be lower if we got rid of driven bear shooting and the intensive management that it depends on. And that's why you should all sign the petition that you can find on the government website. Mark always did write long sentences. <laughs> <laughs> Gary? I'm not an advocate. I would ask, would we be better off not killing any animal for any reason at all? John? Ever. Can get closer to that. John, do you have a <laughs> um, at all? No, I'd just like to thank people for coming this evening and expressing their views. Um, it's an issue which does affect the World Land Trust. I'm very interested in listening to them as well as the sentence. And if you've got <laughs> ideas for the next one on controversial conservation, let me know. I'll keep them dry. Chris? I'd like to ask that the vast majority of responsible shooters in the UK, through all of the journalists which are in attendance tonight, which we're very pleased about, thank you for coming, to lobby your members to join us to see the law of the land respected, upheld and implemented. Because I feel that the illegal minority are damaging the interest of all of your members. And once that was done, we conservationists could work far more cooperatively and creatively with you. Okay, thank you. And Chris, I now well, invite you to give your 
closing remarks. Well, the closing remarks. Fair, no. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it will be fair. It will be fair, Andrew. I, firstly, I, I, I think that Andrew's done a remarkable job because he's come along as a member of a charity but found himself on stage um, at times uh, clearly uncomfortable and unfairly, I have to say, having to speak for the shooting fraternity, so, which isn't fair. That wasn't the role that he undertook, but he's done a fabulous job and his presentation was excellent. So let's have a round of applause. For him. Uh, to try and sum up this evening would be <laughs> extremely difficult, given that you're itching to get to the bar, and it's been such an emotive discussion. I, I think that it's been, uh, uh, hopefully, a success. If it's been controversial, then good, because if that would have stimulated our thoughts. I've learned something from uh, some, all of the presentations, and as a consequence, I should be going away modifying my ideas. That fluidity that I mentioned at the beginning is an essential component to any degree of success that we have here. We will have to explore it. And we've looked at various means, and we've measured degrees of disagreement. But ultimately, all of us in this room want a result. And that's what we have to work towards. And we will only ever achieve that if we are able to creatively discuss it. The very purpose of orchestrating and organising these evenings is to bring these matters to a public forum. And that we have successfully done. So thank you, John, for organising another one. And as you say, if you've got any hot topics which you think that we should be discussing next year, that don't involve the persecution of pandas or the eradication of the entire human race, then please put them forward and we'll be glad to see you again next year. Thank you very much for coming. It's been very stimulating.